Hi. I am so glad to see you back here in the attic with me. You know, uh, that storm out there, I was born in Florida, Daytona Beach, Florida, and uh, I just loved, I just loved those afternoon storms. It's just summer, as I recall, that you have one every single day. You're going to have just big old drenching. And if you're a kid, that means you're going to be able to take off your shoes and go out there and splash around in some of those puddles. It just, it just sounds dreadful now, but being back here in Florida and going through Grandma's things it reminds me. My little girlfriend and I, we'd get our little tin teacup our little saucer, and we'd take it out after it'd been raining like this. We'd go out on the sidewalk, we'd get, get some of that horrible muddy water and put it in our little cup, and then we'd stir it all dainty-like, and then we'd sip it. I swear, it's a wonder any of us ever made it to adulthood, some of the things we did as kids. Anyway, a while ago, I was going through some shelves, and there are a lot of things you know, stuck up there, and I can't see it real well in all the shadows and everything. I, I reached back on kind of a high shelf. I thought, well, is this a radio? Because, you know, we've got that great big cabinet radio up here. But uh, I climbed up on some boxes, and sure enough, I pulled down this, this little bitty radio. And it just brought back such a flood, such a flood of memories. When I was a little girl, Mom always had a radio on top of the refrigerator. I don't know why, but if we'd move, first thing that would happen, very first thing, is Mom would get the kitchen set up. Well, first thing that goes up are the curtains, because it's not home unless there are some curtains at the window, so that went up first. But the next thing is that little radio on top of the refrigerator got plugged in. Well... Daddy, he'd be at work. I was a little girl, I wasn't going to school yet. Mama at noon would take out her ironing board and she'd set it up in the kitchen. And then I'd get a chair and I'd climb up on the chair, then I'd get from there to the, to the counter and I'd sit on the counter and we'd listen to the Kate Smith show. I don't know if you remember Kate Smith or not, but who was it? One of our presidents, I think I read this about Roosevelt, when he introduced Kate Smith to the King of England, he said, this is Kate Smith. She is America. And with it storming like this outside, and just sitting up here in these shadows, being in a place where Grandma and Grandpa, or Pop, had lived for so long, that I haven't been back to now since I was a little kid. I think I, think I was 11 the last time I was here. But just, just sitting there, I could shut my eyes, and I was right back, right, right back in our kitchen. Back in the uh, late 1930s, there was a composer named Irving Berlin, and he wrote a song that Kate Smith introduced on her radio show. Well, he was so impressed that he gave her exclusive rights to that song, meaning that she was the only one who could perform that song publicly. I, I remember her talking about that on a show years later with me perched up there on the kitchen counter and Mom ironing in front of me. And so it was the first time I heard it, of course, first time anybody in the public ever heard of it. But I never forgot it, that's for sure.
most kids, it seems, uh, got to go to one school, make friends, go back years later for reunions, but God had something else in mind for me. I may have been born in Daytona Beach, and Mama may have had her roots in Florida as well, but she met fun-loving, charismatic, adventuresome <laughs> Leslie Cox when she was just 17. And they got married when she turned 18, and she had me the month after she turned 19. So she was still pretty much a kid herself. It was just after Depression time, and Daddy was only 22. And he earned his keep by being a stuntman, though I, I never heard anybody call him that. Just all these years later, I realized if it had a name, that's what it would have been called. He thought up ways to make a dollar by doing things that people like to watch and that sponsors like to back. So he jumped from a single-engine plane into a tiny little fishing boat out past the breakers at Daytona Beach. And Mama told me, she said, the crowds would just hold its collective breath while he'd leap from the plane and then wait for what seemed like forever to open his parachute before landing. Now, I told you the other day about how he narrowly missed being uh, bayoneted during uh, the war. But, but listen to this. Daddy had a kid, a teen boy, I think probably paid him a dime a day or something, who prepared his parachute before each jump. But on this particular day, a a as he took the chute from the little shack where the kid assembled it, Daddy told Mom that he got the strangest feeling in the pit of his stomach. And something told him to open that chute, to take a closer look before getting into the plane. And the feeling was so strong, he said, that he couldn't ignore it. So he did what he'd never done before. With only a few minutes before takeoff, and with the crowds gathering on the beach to watch, he stopped to unpack the parachute and found that it was riddled with moth holes. Had he gone up thousands of feet in the plane and jumped, the chute would have done him no good at all when it opened, and he would have plummeted either into the ocean and no doubt drowned being tangled in cumbersome gear, or he would have smashed himself into smithereens in the fishing boat. God sure was with him that day, and he never stopped talking about the miracle of an angel whispering in his ear to check the chute, even though he'd never done it before. So Mama, totally in love with her rogue young husband, just followed him wherever he got the notion to take us, which means I began my travels when I was just three months old. And surprisingly enough, not at three months, but you know, a little after, I remember a good deal of those times. I think because my home was the back seat of our car and, and Mama kept it made up with sweet-smelling blankets and crisp, clean sheets. It, it was a blessing in so many ways. I got to observe two people who adored one another, who were focused on being young and in love. And as for me, my little girl Mama treated me like a baby doll. I remember her changing my outfits three, four, five times a day, but it was the way you dressed a doll. She never cuddled me or talked to me. She just loved having something she could fix up real pretty and then put in the back seat. Daddy was her world. Now, from behind the steering wheel, he'd glance in the rearview mirror every so often and our eyes would meet. I'm, I'm talking about being, oh, maybe by this time, three or four years old, maybe even five. Well, he'd grin his wonderful grin, and he'd give me a wink. I was such a happy toddler. Mama, 
Uh, she sang like an angel. So mile after mile across this great, big, beautiful country, she'd sing. And Daddy, who couldn't carry a tune, he'd whistle. You know, a lot of people used to whistle. A lot of men used to whistle. I remember that now. But I didn't until I thought about telling you this story. Anyway, Mom, she'd find music on the car radio that they could sing and whistle to. So years later, a lot of years later, I ran across some of the songs that I remember Daddy whistling. Uh, There was a a Ted Weems orchestra, and a man who was uh, their star attraction was named Elmo Tanner, and he whistled so beautifully. I don't know if Daddy learned from him or if he just happened to sound like him, But at three or four years old, I really, (laughs) I didn't care. I was cuddled up on the back seat, surrounded by books I couldn't even read, but I loved the scent of them. Listening to my daddy whistle us out of Florida, into Georgia, across Washington, D.C., Texas, and on to Arizona with its Grand Canyon and its painted desert. We explored the country for for a few years before we made it back to Florida in time for Daddy to join the CBs when war broke out. That's when Mom and I spent so much time in Tampa with, with Dandy and Pop. You know, those great old radio shows that I listened to on their cabinet radio? Well, I'd grown to love those back when Mom would work through all the static to find them on the dashboard radio as we traveled cross-country. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, murders are better than ever. Mr. Diamond? I stand condemned. Uh, My name is Arnold Bryce. I'm an art collector. Well, unless you're looking for empty beer bottles, I'm afraid you have the wrong man. You're a detective, aren't you? That's right. Well, then you're the man I want. How soon can you come over to my home? Well, that depends on two things, where you live and what you want me for. I live at 9607 Riverside Drive, but I'd rather tell you the nature of your assignment in person, if you don't mind. Well, that suits me, but my fee is a hundred a day in expenses. Still want me to come over? Money is no object, Mr. Diamond. Please hurry. Yes? Uh, My name's Diamond. I'd like to see Mr. Bryce. Mr. Arnold Bryce? That's right. Well, come in, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bryce is busy with an art dealer in the library, sir. You can wait in the gallery. The gallery? The art gallery. This way, sir. He led me down the hall and into a room that looked like it was once a den. There was a piano in the room, and hanging over the fireplace was a large painting of the Mona Lisa. The other three walls were all covered with pictures, too. This, I took it, was the gallery. Just make yourself comfortable, sir. I'll tell Mr. Brasher here when he's finished. Thank you. Beautiful room, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Lots of paintings. I didn't mean the paintings. I meant the room. Oh, I take it you don't like the art? No, sir. I only appreciate what I can see in a picture. This room used to be a study until Mr. Arnold Bryce came. And who had it before? Mr. Jasper Bryce. He died two months ago and left this house to Mr. Arnold. Well, I must get on with my work, sir. The butler gave a disgusted look at the paintings and took his leave. Come to think of it, I agreed with the old boy. Most of the paintings were what is called modern, which is sort of a nasty poke at the present period. Hi there. If you're a burglar, just help yourself. Take them all if you want to. Well, I didn't know I had company. That's because you're not a very good burglar. 
You should be more careful. You, no doubt, are the local police force. <laughs> no, I won't turn you in. I... Oh, what's use? Used to be I could joke. Used to be I liked to joke. Now it's no fun. Who are you, really? What do you want here? Can I fix you a drink? Hey, that's a lot of questions for a little girl. Little girl. <laughs> she staggered over to a couch and sat down while I took a good look at her. Beautiful is a word thrown around a lot these days, but it could only describe her. She had soft brown hair, big brown eyes, with a sort of a pleading look about them. She was wearing a pair of lounging pajamas, but her figure was nothing to speak of. When you found one like this, you kept the news to yourself. Ugly. What's that? I said ugly. Oh. Meaning those pictures. You like pictures? Oh, you look like the type who would like pictures. Well, I'm flattered. Look at that one. You ever see such a mess? That's night chasing away the morning in September. Well, you could have fooled me. That's my husband's favorite. You a friend of my husband? No. Neither am I. All he does is buy paintings. He's a nut about paintings. He should have married one. You must be Mrs. Bryce. I must be. Then that's life. Oh, who'd you say you were? I didn't, but the name's Diamond. My name's Della. You know... Mr. Diamond, Mr. Bryce will see you now. Oh, get lost, Timothy. Mr. Diamond and I are just getting acquainted. But Mr. Bryce said... Mr. Bryce. Mr. Bryce. All right, you better go and see him, Mr. Diamond. My husband hates to be kept waiting. Me, I'd rather be alone anyway. I'm going to sit here till I figure out just why in Blaze's night is chasing morning away in September. I left Bella Bryce staring at the picture and followed Timothy to the library. Inside, I met Mr. Arnold Bryce. He was a big man and looked old enough to be Della's father. On the desk lay another modern painting, and he sat admiring it like it was the deed to the Taj Mahal. Look at it, Diamond. Look at it. Uh, yes, um, a masterpiece. Masterpiece. Well, it's original, all right. Of course, I buy nothing but originals. Can't stand copies, can you? Well, I, I really haven't thought about it lately. Uh, uh, tell me, is this uh, masterpiece what you wanted to see me about? Oh, no, 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 no. Just thought you'd enjoy seeing it. Mm-hmm. Well, now that we've had our kick, suppose we get on to business. Fine, fine. Mr. Diamond, I'm number 34 on this city's social register. Do you follow me? No, I'm about six millionth. Please, sir, I'm very serious. Sorry. Now then, one in my position must be discreet. Divorce, heaven's knows, is scandal enough, but, well, to have a roust about for a wife, that I cannot tolerate. Heaven's no. I was married a little over six months ago, and, to be frank, Mr. Diamond, my wife doesn't like me. Go on. That's all. I want to get rid of her. Uh, Mr. Bryce, I'm a detective, not an assassin. Of course, of course. I, I want you to help me find the grounds for divorce. Oh, well, a case like this can take a long while. And a hundred a day, that can add up to quite a bill. I hired you because I've heard you're the finest detective in New York. Oh, well, thanks for the flattery, but the fee is still a hundred a day, and I told you over the phone money meant nothing to me. Here. Here's a check I made out to you. It's for $500. That should serve as a retainer. Well, uh, yes, that's... Uh... Well, I... Now then, we can get on with this. Uh, I think my wife is in love with another man. No. Yes. And I think that... <laughs> I keep forgetting these walls are soundproof. Uh, we've only lived in this house a few weeks. My Uncle Jasper left it to me. Yes, your butler told me. Uh, Timothy? Uh, well, Dr. Timothy, Uncle Jasper left me him, too. Oh. Well, uh, let's get back to your wife. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Diamond, when I married Della, I thought we'd be well-suited. She's very beautiful. And, uh... I guess where we met. I have no idea. In an art gallery. Naturally, I thought Della would be an art lover like myself. I could just picture her sitting in front of the fire on cold winter evenings, gazing at my originals. Thrilling thought. Yes, but it wasn't to be. Della deceived me. She hates my paintings. Well, it takes all kinds to make a world. Yes, but my world is art, Mr. Diamond, and Della is no part of my world. I see, but that uh, hardly uh, sounds like grounds for divorce, Mr. Bryant. Oh, I realize that, but maybe this is. You see, Della used to date a boy named David Farp. Now she's been going out a lot lately, and I think she may be seeing him again. Mm-hmm. You think? Well, oh, I... Oh, I know it. 
really may be nothing, but if she should be seeing him and we could prove it, wouldn't that be grounds? Well, no, no. Possibly. Yeah. Now, now, this boy used to work for the Gorman department store, and if he's still in town, I want him watched. All right, I'll, uh, I'll check for the store and report to you later. Good, good. Timothy will show you out, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> I left Mr. Arnold Bryce admiring the monstrosity he had purchased earlier. On the way out, I took another peek into the gallery to see if Bella Bryce was still around. She wasn't. And then I noticed the Mona Lisa again. Somehow it seemed so out of place. I was staring at it when Timothy came up behind me. I see you admire the lady. Say, don't you ever make noise? Beautiful, isn't she? The Mona Lisa, sir? Yes. Look at that face. The most lovely face in the world. I thought you didn't like art. Not what Mr. Bryce calls art. Only that picture. Do you know about it? Do I know about it? Oh, so many things. It really has a colorful history. Da Vinci painted her over 400 years ago. No. Yes. Zenobia del Giocondo's wife posed for Leonardo four years before it was finished. My, my. Everyone loves it. Francis I of France paid 4,000 golden florins for it. You really know the facts, huh? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I've read many books about La Gioconda's history. I come here often and just stared into her face. Do you know that men have stared into the mystery of that face and then killed themselves? You don't say. Yes. But I'm probably boring you this way, sir. <laughs> He took a last tender look at the picture and then led the way to the door. It was a crazy house full of crazy people and it felt good to be outside again. The job I had was strictly routine, but as long as Bryce paid for my services, he'd get them. I took off for lunch, then went to the Gorm department store to find David Tharp. There I found Tharp, had joined the Army six weeks ago and was now stationed in California. That meant that Bryce's suspicions about his wife were unfounded. At least as far as Tharp was concerned. Hello? Let me speak to Mr. Bryce. Who's this? Oh, that worn-out voice sounds familiar. Walt? Yeah, is this Diamond? Yeah, but what are you doing there? Or did I dial the wrong number? You calling Arnold Bryce, Rick? That's right. Then you have the right number. Was he a client of yours? Uh-oh. I don't like the way you said was. You guessed it. Better get over here, Rick. Arnold Bryce has been murdered. In my pocket was a check for $500, signed by one Arnold Bryce. The same Arnold Bryce was now dead, according to Lieutenant Walt Levinson, who was very reliable in these matters. I took a cab to the Bryce home on Riverside Drive. Timothy, the tall, gaunt butler, again let me in. His expression hadn't changed since I'd seen him earlier. Well, Timothy, a lot of excitement around here, huh? Yes, sir. The police are in the gallery. So is Mr. Arnold's buddy. Gruesome sight. Rick. Hello, Walt. He's in there. Want to have a look at him? Why not? The boys in the lab are all finished. There. There he is. Hmm. Head bash then, huh? Garner says he's been dead for about two hours. That place is the time of the murder around noon. Found the murder weapon? No. Nope. Figured it must be the missing poker from this fireplace set. Got the boys upstairs now looking for it. Who found the body, Walt? Mrs. Bryce. Otis is in the library now taking your statement. So what's your angle in this? Well, uh, Bryce hired me for some stock investigating. He was thinking of divorcing his wife. Well, at last we've got a motive. She finds out he's getting rid of her and knocks him off. Oh, maybe. Who else was in the house? It's the butler, the maid, and Mrs. Bryce. Otis is sure the butler did it. Been reading murder mysteries again. No. How about visitors? Anyone come to see Bryce around noon? No, apparently not. Looks like an inside job, Rick. We've got three suspects, and all we can do is grill them till one of them breaks down. So we might as well start on the wife. Mind if I sit in? No. Come on. We left the gallery and walked down to the library. Inside sat Bella Bryce, patiently answering the questions of that master detective, that super sleuth, Sergeant Otis Lovelune. Hello, Lieutenant. 
I got a statement down on paper, and I'm asking some questions on my own. She's a... Uh... Oh, Diamond. That looks a happy, Otis. Hello, Mrs. Bryce. Well, you come back. That man, Lieutenant, he's the one who saw my husband earlier. Yes, we know that, Mrs. Bryce. This is Richard Diamond. He's a private detective. Oh, well, what would Arnold want with a private detective? It seems he was planning to divorce you. Or didn't you know that yet? Divorce me? <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> you want to tell us the joke, too, Mrs. Bryce? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> oh, come now. Maybe it's Otis, Walt. After all, she's been looking at that face of his for an hour. Can you blame her? Hey, I heard that. Oh, I'm sorry, but that just struck me funny. That worm of a husband was going to divorce me. Well, I've already talked to a lawyer about getting rid of him. I take it you and Mr. Bryce didn't get along? You said it. I married Arnold because I thought it would be fun to have a big home and a nice car. All those things money can buy. Go on. Well, the money part was okay, but Arnold... Well, a girl can only take so much. It's a nice, respectful way to speak of the dead. All right, so he's dead. So now I get all that money and don't have to put up with Arnold. I should cry? Maybe a jury will think you picked up a poker in order to get that money. Now, look. Just because I'm not crying and moaning about how much I loved Arnold doesn't mean I killed him. I didn't. We'll decide that. And will you please tell this baboon to stop asking me questions another hour and hear with him and I'd confess to anything? Good old Otis, the traveling third degree. Now, look, Shamus. Take it easy, Otis. Now, Mrs. Bryce, you say you were upstairs fixing your hair around noon? That's right. What about your lunch? Don't you eat? I'm on a diet. Look, it's all there in my statement. Around one o'clock, I came downstairs and found the body. I called the police and that's all I know. Well, then if you're innocent, you won't object to answering questions. So, make yourself comfortable. Walt kept asking questions, and Della kept answering them. Half an hour later, Walt was getting tired. Della was getting tired, and I was already tired. Grilling a suspect is the most boring thing in the world, and it was a relief when Walt sent the girl upstairs. Otis, you see that she goes to her room and then bring that maid in here. Right, Lieutenant. Well, Rick, what do you think? I think she's innocent, Walt. Oh, you do? Uh, why? Because she leaves herself wide open. She admits she's glad the guy's dead. So maybe that's all a front to throw suspicion off her. She makes everything point toward her, and she thinks we'll figure she couldn't be that dumb. Mm, maybe, but uh, I don't think so. I think Otis was right. Huh? What are you talking about? Well, you said he thought the butler did it. So do I. Rick, I'm in no mood for jokes. Look, Walt, the guy was bashed in the head, right? The top of the head. Now, Bryce is close to six feet tall. So is Timothy. Della's too short. She couldn't hit him on top of the head unless she stood on the ladder. Yeah, thought of that. But you can't convict a guy because he's tall enough to hit Bryce on top of the head. Besides, maybe Bryce stooped over to tie a shoelace. Any number of reasons. Mm, maybe, maybe. But I, I still bet Timothy killed him. Okay, Sherlock. Tell me one more thing. Why? Why did he kill him? He's only worked for him two weeks. No money's missing. Where's the motive? I'm not sure, Walt. But I think it's in a picture. Huh? Oh, now, Rick. Walt, when I was here earlier, I talked to Timothy in the art gallery. We talked about the Mona Lisa. Well, what about it? He knew everything about it. A lot of its history. Now, here's a guy who hates all these paintings around but one. The Mona Lisa. But what's it doing here? What's what doing here? The Mona Lisa. Bryce told me himself he only collected originals. But the Mona Lisa hangs in the Louvre in France. That picture of the fireplace is only a copy, and Bryce hated copies. Go on. That's all. I don't know exactly why or how all this happened. I only know things don't add up. Timothy's admiration for that one painting, and what's it doing here? Hmm. And somewhere in there you think there's a murder motive. Why not? Sure, Della might have killed him for the money. That's a nice, big, fat motive. But, Walt, how many murders have big, fat motives? Darn few. Well, you're right there. A girl kills her sister because she called her fatty. A man shoots his wife for nagging. A woman poisons her neighbor for gossiping. A lot of little things can turn a twisted mind into a murderous mind. In here, miss. Oh, look, Dan, I'm so sorry about this. Can I help you? Well, I'm feeling to cry. Please, you can't think I have anything to do with it. <laughs> no, Mr. Uh, just <laughs> sit down, miss. We just want you to answer some questions. Now, don't be frightened, dear. We 
We don't think you killed Mr. Bryce, but you might help us find out who did. Oh, well, I'm glad to help. Good. Now, uh, how long have you worked here? Oh, well, let me see. It has been, uh, uh, five years. Uh, five years they have been here. They worked for Mr. Bryce's uncle. Then when he died, they stay on. Oh. And Timothy, how long has he worked here? Oh, yes, my Timothy has been here all his life. He has told me about it. His father worked for the old Mr. Jasper Blythe and his mother, too. Timothy, he grew up in that house. Then when his father died, he'd take over his job. I see. Now, uh, about the young Mr. Bryce, Arnold. Was he easy to get along with? Well, they don't know him so well, but they have no trouble with him. Timothy does not agree with him at times, but they have no trouble. Timothy doesn't agree with him? What do you mean? Well, Mr. Arnold changed a lot of things. Move furniture and such. Timothy thinks they look better where they have always been. Just this morning, they argue. Mr. Bryce wants Timothy to get rid of something, but they do not remember what it is. Oh. Then one more question. The room with all the paintings. Do you remember that room before Mr. Arnold Bryce came here? Oh, yeah. He used to clean there. But there was not all the paintings there then. No painting? Uh, not all there is, no. Just the one. The painting of the pretty lady. The Mona Lisa. The... Uh, what did you say? The Mona Lisa. Yeah, that's it. That is what Timothy and Mr. Bryce was having words about this morning. The Mona... Uh, Mona Lisa. That was it. I looked at Walt and I could see that he was interested. Now there was a motive. Oh, not the big headline motive, just the kind you'll read on page six of your local paper... The kind of story that usually says the murderer is now undergoing sanity tests. Otis showed the maid out and left Walt and me with our little brains racing a mile a minute. I don't know. We still haven't got anything to convict him. Walt, he's a psycho, that's for sure. Now, the way I see it, he's crazy about that one picture. He grew up in the house. Maybe it means something to him. Then in comes Bryce with all his modern junk and orders Timothy to get rid of the Mona Lisa. Yeah. But Timmy argues and Bryce insists. They were both in the library, so maybe Bryce was even going to take it down himself. Uh, could be. Then our boy gets mad, grabs the nearest thing, which happened to be the poker. Okay, so it fits. We have a theory. But we still need one thing to convict him. A confession. Yeah. Maybe we can use the Mona Lisa. What? He killed for it. He may talk for it. I outlined my plan to Walt. Timothy was a psychopathic. And I knew we'd have to get him in the right kind of mood. Walt agreed with the plan, and we headed for the gallery. They had removed Bryce's body from the room, and only a deep red spot in the carpet was left. Walt went looking for Timothy, and I moved over to the piano. In here, Timothy. Oh, hello, Rick. Hi, Walt. Just thought I'd pass the time at the piano. All right. Just sit down, Timothy. I want you to wait here where I can locate you. I want to question you later. Yes, sir. I'll call you if I need you, Rick. Okay, Walt. Well, I guess I'd better stop fooling around at the piano and do what I came here for. His eyes were on me as I got up from the piano bench and walked over to the fireplace. I tried not to look at him as I reached up for the picture, but I heard him jump from his chair. What are you doing? Leave that alone. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but Mrs. Bryce is all upset about her husband's death. She asked me if I wouldn't carry out his last wish and get rid of this. Caught us up the other pictures, you know. Leave it alone. Take the others, but leave that alone. Sorry, but out it goes to the trash pile. No, it belongs here. The living part of this house. Put it down, I said, put it down. I warned you. Now, now, Timothy, take it easy. Put on the shovel. When you put down the picture. Oh, and if I don't, you'll swing that shovel at me just the way you swung a poker at Bryce. He was an idiot. Throw it out, he said. Throw it out and leave that other trash on the walls. And now you. You want to throw it out, too? No. Now, give me that painting. All right, Timothy. You've got it. Rick, are you all right? Yeah. See how Timothy is. He'll come around. You heard from the door? Yeah, enough. Imagine. All this over a picture of a dame. Well, 
I sure do thank you for covering the countryside with me and with my folks and for sticking around to see what's in Grandma's attic. You know, I don't know if you or anybody else really want to hear about my childhood, but the point I hope I'm making is how long-lasting the experiences are that we have with our children. And I'm so glad Mama didn't rush me from one activity to another, grabbing fast food on the run. The pace was slower, yes, but that allowed me to understand that what I saw outside the car window as we passed through cities and small towns was not only beautiful, but unique. Each two-lane highway, each restaurant and cafe, reflected the part of the country we were in. And I'm glad Daddy stopped to talk to the service station attendants who proudly wore a sharp, clean uniform and who took real pleasure in checking the car's oil and water and air in our tires. There was a sense of togetherness at that time. There was, it was, it was so apparent that even a kid could miss it. What we say and do with our children will last a lifetime, you know. And we never realize the power of our influence until many years later. And speaking of later, do come back and let's check out. There's a big box in the corner of the attic over there that I'm dying to see what's in it. As usual, I, I do want to thank David Fesleyan of Fesleyan Studios for the beautiful theme titled Lovers. And Peter Herman of Unsplash for that lovely graphic. And Radio Echoes for providing us with recordings of The Kate Smith Show and Richard Diamond Private Eyes, The Mona Lisa Case. And don't forget to subscribe to Sunday Stories and to like us, if you will. But you come back soon. Hear me? Oh, and be sure to check out one of the very best storytellers on YouTube, Jared King at Jared King TV. Time to go this time. So till next time, God bless. <laughs>